The following program is a UWTV classic. University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marsha Alvar. Early in 1942, just weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor, tens of thousands of American citizens were rounded up and put in camps. Their property and businesses valued as high as $2 billion were seized by the government. The reason given for this extraordinary action was military necessity, but the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians found otherwise. Its 1983 report, called Personal Justice Denied, has just been reissued by University of Washington Press, with a new foreword by Tetsuden Kashima, an associate professor in the UW's Department of American Ethnic Studies. Welcome to Upon Reflection. Thank you very much. This report was first issued 14 years ago, and in the new foreword in this new publication, you say the conclusions are not unique uh, and they're not startling. So why republish this report? When I say they're not unique or startling, that's from a particular perspective. Even from the camp days when persons of Japanese ancestry were behind barbed wires, people were protesting in many ways the incarceration. And then, even from 1945, uh, noted scholars such as Walt Rostow, a legal scholar, had said that the incarceration of persons of Japanese ancestry was our worst wartime mistake. And through that period from 1945 up to 1980s, numerous scholars, numerous persons have said it was a mistake, that the government's uh, idea of a military necessity was not, in fact, uh, a reality. But um, when all it was said and done, it was not the government that said it. It was scholars, it was persons of Japanese ancestry, it was people who were obviously biased. But then uh, in 1982, when this report was, uh, was issued, it was a congressional committee um, sponsored by the United States of America, um, uh, approved the, com the, the, the funding for the commission approved by the President of the United States, and their finding was, I think reflective of the uh, United States government when they said that the rationale of military necessity was in fact not a substantia substantiable uh, rationale. So this report has a kind of heft, it has a kind of official um, stamp, stamp on of it. of approval, yes. Whereas before it was, a, it was a whole group of other people who had good credentials. They were college professors or they were noted writers, but they didn't have the as I call it the imprimatur of the United States government saying mm. that a mistake had been done. One of the, uh, the other things that's going on uh, sort of simultaneously with the reissuing of this, of this report is an exhibit that's making its way around the country. Um, it's visiting the University of Washington as we sit here and have this conversation. We're going to take a look at some of the images that are part of this exhibit uh, with a couple of other aspects to it that are also uh, at the Allen Library on the University of Washington campus. No, no, we're citizens. This is, this is America, you know. Uh, democracy, we don't do things like that. Exclusion order is a little different. You have to move off, you have to register to move off to a, a, a confined area. And, uh, uh, and still, it's a funny thing, I expect it to go. of the 
these concerns frightened me as they told us we were going to camp. We just figured they were sending us up in the mountains somewhere. I never left Los Angeles County till I was moved out. For young people like me, I was 18. I turned 18 first week in camp. And then the second camp, Topaz, was when I was in uh, uh, first grade. It occurred to me, if I couldn't conform to curfew, how could I conform to this, which is so much more drastic in terms of implication? Both were bad in terms of citizenship uh, violation. Images from A More Perfect Union, which is a traveling exhibit uh, partly put together by the Smithsonian. When I went and saw the exhibit, uh, one of the things I'd, I learned from it was that I really didn't know very much about what happened when the camps were emptied. I, I knew about the camps. I had seen and, and read a good deal about that and the, and the roundup, but not the re-entry. Talk about what it was like for people to come out of those camps and try to re-enter the mainstream of American society? Um, I was in camp. I was a year old when we went to uh, Tamferan Assembly Center. Our family was in uh, Oakland, California. Then we went to Topaz. And from Topaz, then uh, um, we left. My father was an Issei, or first generation Japanese, uh, an immigrant from Japan, as, as was my mother. My father was a uh, Buddhist priest, and an immigrant, an Issei, could not return back to the West Coast for some time. And so the uh, Ogden Buddhist Church asked him to be the uh, priest there. So this is in Ogden, Utah. Ogden, Utah. So we left from Topaz, Utah, went up through Delta, through Salt Lake to Ogden, and stayed there from about 1945 to about 1948. But however, there are other people who were able to come back to the West Coast. But when they came back, in many cases, they found that uh, homes that they had um, had before had been sold under them, or businesses that they had uh, put in other people's safekeeping ha were no longer uh, there because uh, someone had not paid the taxes that had been sent to them from, from the camps. In other cases, people went back and the farms were there, and, and the people, Japanese Americans who had uh, had someone take care of them, found that they were in very good shape and, and, and you know, had their farm returned back to them. So it's a mixed bag. But in most cases, when they came back, most people on the West Coast could not find a place to stay. So many uh, churches and other uh, agencies created hostels so people can stay for a little while. And then while they look for more, well, at least for apartments or more permanent places to live, then they went out. In the meantime, too, they had to find temporary jobs, so they took jobs as, as custodians and uh, other low-skilled jobs until they can get back and re-enter into the, the mainstream society. If the war was over, there would be no more military necessity to say where people could or couldn't live. What was the rationale for not allowing the, the Issei to live on the West Coast? There was still at that time uh, deep animosity and suspicion of anyone who looked like the enemy in the Pacific, even though the majority of the people, over 60 percent, were American citizens of Japanese ancestry. Mm. And so uh, on the West Coast, as opposed to Hawaii, it was difficult for these Japanese to come back initially. How widespread was the kind of thing that we saw? at the end of the tape, the Japs must not come back, move along, this is a, a white man's neighborhood. Was this a kind of fringe element or was it really widespread? If you want a qualitative answer, I'd say it's pretty widespread. If you want a quantitative, how many, it's hard to say. But we have stories such as uh, Senator Daniel Inoue, uh, a captain in the army with his uniform, and I think uh, he had lost his left arm in the, uh, in the uh, European war. He went to go get a haircut uh, in Oakland, and he was told, even though he's wearing this army uniform, that uh, we don't serve mm -hmm. Japs here. One of the things, then, in your foreword continues to puzzle me, and that is that you say that, that this whole matter of the, of the incarceration 
was not widely known mm -hmm. by the general public in this country, and yet we see signs in neighborhoods, uh, books that were published, and it, it seems contradictory to me. How was it that people couldn't know about this? I think there the question will be, uh, who didn't know about it? And I would say within the uh, American society, the reason why I wrote that is, obviously anyone probably under the age of uh, 18 would not be aware of what's going on. Uh, anyone older than that, uh, they would be more involved with the, the war in Europe and the Pacific. Uh, they knew about the Japanese problem on the West Coast, but I think if we look at people in Kalamazoo, Michigan, or <clears throat> uh, Tampa, Florida, that uh, uh, this was more seen as a West Coast phenomenon. Mm. And of course they might have known that there were uh, places in which people who looked like the Japanese enemy were, were put. But when I say not well known, it was only that kind of, uh, you know, the government's taking care of them kind of idea. They didn't know the whole uh, issue about uh, the forced exclusion, the forced detention or internment, about the Justice Department picking up the, the, um, the uh, Japanese nationals, along with German and Italian nationals and putting them away. They didn't know about the entire story. Hmm. That's, what I, that's what I meant by when I said they didn't know uh, about the incarceration. Now, the reasons uh, that the commission gave uh, for why this happened, there were three major reasons. One, uh, racism, uh, part of a long history of, of discrimination against immigrants from Asia to this country, things like immigra uh, immigration restrictions and, and the like. Uh, a kind of hysteria uh, that, that had hit the country at the time uh, following Pearl Harbor. The third, though, I find the most intriguing, mm -hmm. and that is a failure of political leadership. Talk about that cause. You know, Gordon Hirabashi, one of the persons that was on the tape, and uh, another person, Fred Korematsu, and another person, Min Yasui, had, uh, in 1942, disobeyed the military laws with respect to curfew and exclusion from the West Coast. To make it real brief, the Supreme Court found uh, the uh, uh, decisions to be constitutional. Forty some years later, the, uh, uh, the, the federal courts, <coughs> not the Supreme Court, <coughs> uh, overturned and vacated those early convictions even though the sentences had been completed. Why? Because uh, documents had been found by people like uh, Professor Peter Irons in the archives, which showed that when the um, government had argued the necessity with respect to military or with respect to the, um, the dangerousness of these people, that in fact the government knew that there was uh, no evidence to support that. And in fact that they had, the Justice Department had in fact not uh, told them, not have not uh, did not say the complete truth to the Supreme Court um, and misrepresented facts and therefore 40 some years later under a un relatively unknown um, legal uh, phenomenon, the writ of error quorum nobis, uh, the, the judgments were vacated and uh, Fred Korematsu and Gordon Hirabashi were uh, restored their rights. So it was a matter of a failure of political and judicial leadership. Yes. Uh, there is some reason to believe that uh, um, more than the Justice Department knew that there was <coughs> really no military necessity to put these uh, people behind barbed bars. For example, uh, the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, himself had argued that there was no need for mass, e mass incarceration. The, the people who argued for it and supported it, in retrospect, are an odd group. Earl Warren, Attorney General then of the state of California. William O. Douglas, Justice of the Supreme Court, known as a, a very liberal uh, politicians. Milton Eisenhower, who headed up the, the commission. When I, when I was reading about the failure of political leadership, it sort of begged the question, could any of these people have stopped this? Was oh. that a choice that they had? Well, if we just go back for a minute, we now know that um, people like uh, Milton Eisenhower, who was the first WRA director, and um, uh, Earl Warren, have, and, and uh, Douglas, uh, Justice Douglas, have since <clears throat> made statements that said they regretted 
their involvement in the incarceration. Um, people find it hard to believe, but if you look at the memoirs of Chief, Chief uh, of Earl Warren, it's straight in there. Could they have changed the um, um, decision? That is a what-if question, um, because it wasn't a single individual that uh, caused the incarceration. I think the causes, if we look at race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership, race prejudice goes back from the, almost the first years of the, of the immigration of Japanese into America. And there have been a number of both uh, state and then national laws directed against persons of Japanese ancestry. In a sense, it culminated with Pearl Harbor. So it's really hard to say whether an individual could have. One individual we know had the responsibility, and that was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Hmm. Another uh, interesting person to have signed Executive Order 9066. The, the reason I lead in this direction in our conversation is that I know one of the major interests that you have in exploring this chapter of our history is not so much in the why it happened, but in the how it could happen. You're at work on a new uh, book about this. Talk about sort of the genesis of this whole action, because it's, it's your contention, and you've researched it, documented, that the planning for this began uh, years before Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor. I'm not alone in uh, saying that it started years before. Um, so I don't take full credit for that. Um, but with uh, very well-documented pieces like Personal Justice Denied, who talk about the cause of it, uh, my feeling is that uh, in order for us to understand the causes, we also must understand the process, how it is that this came about. And so I start way back in the 1920s, even with people like uh, J. 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 Edgar Hoover in the Justice Department, who argued that uh, the, the uh, Japanese constituted a uh, grave threat to the security of the United States. And in fact, um, there is evidence that they were investigating Japanese along with uh, black Americans thinking that they would band together to overthrow <laughs> the, the, uh, the uh, United States government. As there had been, I was thinking as I was getting ready for this interview, the Palmer Raids. That's right, Mitchell Palmer Raids. But uh, from the 20s then, we find uh, various pockets of, of groups and individuals who are concerned about this uh, presence of Japanese uh, on the West Coast. See, Japan was a very powerful nation, and ever since the Russo-Japanese War, they were seen to be uh, a military uh, power in the East. And we know that since the, since the 30s, you know, Japan had uh, gone into Manchuria. They had already um, uh, taken uh, Korea. And so it, it, it was not an idle threat here. It was just not an idle piece of uh, anxiety. You know, Japan was a military power. However, I would make the differentiation between Japan as a nation and then the permanent residents of Japanese ancestry who, uh, who are here. And so the how of it, to me, starts back in the 20s. It goes through the 30s. And we know from about 1940 and 41 that were, there were discussions between Justice Department and the War Department on what to do when the war started. See, the war was already uh, occurring in, uh, in, in, in Europe and in Japan. So most uh, high-level officials in America knew that eventually we'd probably get into a war. And who would be our most likely adversaries? Germany and probably Japan and Italy. And so even from 1940 and 41, there were plans made with respect to if we go to war, when we go to war, what are we going to do? So when, when the Japanese imperial uh, forces attacked uh, uh, the uh, United States on Pearl Harbor, at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, then this pre-planned pre uh, all in place. Was, was already Ready there. And even before we declared war, the United States started to arrest uh, persons of, of Japanese, German, and Italian nationals in various locales, including some uh, citizens of Japanese, German, and Italian ancestry. So it, it starts with a series of memos, meetings, bureaucratic decisions, sure. and the small gears of bureaucracy grind their way. And um, 
I was in the army as a, um, a lieutenant in army intelligence, and you know we we make plans in the army, and we call them contingency plans. Hopefully, they are never they never have to be uh, uh, carried out. But in this case, we knew because of the war in Europe and in Asia that probably the United States would go to war. So that was a pretty high. There was a high probability that we we, we would have to implement this kind of plan. One of the uh, questions that began being raised really as part of the civil rights movement and the whole attitude that developed in the 60s about challenging government and, and questioning, uh, questions raised particularly by third generation Japanese Americans, the Sansei, how could this happen? Why did you go? Why haven't you told me? Why has there been so much silence? Mm -hmm. That's a very serious question. Um, when the United States government picked up people after December 7th, these were nationals or enemy aliens. And uh, enemy aliens um, could be considered to be much more, quote, dangerous than others. But with February uh, 19th, 1942, and Executive Order 9066, the the uh, result of that was the incarceration of almost 90% of all persons of Japanese ancestry, most of whom were American citizens. Therefore, people like Gordon Hirabashi or in, in the tape that you saw, who were American citizens thought, you know, uh, we, we are protected by the Constitution. There's no reason why we should be uh, incarcerated. And yet they were. And so they go to camp and they come back out. And so from a period of about 1945 to about 1955, I think uh, the Japanese Americans did not talk about the camps. And to understand that, uh, we have to go back and see what went on in camps. Here we find uh, almost powerless group who were incarcerated. They weren't charged with any crimes. They had committed no acts against the United States. And yet they had this onus of being dangerous placed upon them. It was shame. Shame. They had no way of being able to say, wait a minute, uh, we haven't done anything. You know, why are you doing this? And when they came out, they had no recourse but to just readjust their life and go on with it. They didn't tell their children because in many ways, many people say they were too young to tell them. But also, there were many things in camp that uh, precluded people from talking about what had gone on. Let me give you one example. The United States government uh, in 1943 allowed for people to renounce their citizenship in time of war if you signed it and the Attorney General uh, accepts it. Now, if a United States citizen renounces his or her citizenship, she becomes or he becomes a non-citizen. But then what happens? Well, what the United States said was, if you're a non-citizen, we're going to treat you like a national, and since you, your ancestry is Japanese, we're going to take you and deport you to Japan. Many families had to decide, you know, uh, if the United States is not going to accept me, well, what am I going to do, even though I'm a citizen? Mm. So about 5,000 persons actually did sign renunciation uh, forms. So there was a fear uh, as well, particularly by this first generation. Yes. Now, at the time of the redress movement, which really took about 11 years, from 1979 when legislation was first introduced in Congress to when the, the redress uh, payments were actually, the checks were actually issued, there was considerable division, among, again, sometimes along generational lines, about whether or not this was a good thing to do or whether the past should just mm -hmm. remain buried. Mm -hmm. Have those divisions since, I mean, some years have now passed, do you think those divisions within the Japanese-American community have been resolved? No. Well, let, let me start by saying there's a Japanese uh, concept called shikadaganai, cannot be helped. And so when the idea of the redress first came up, then the divisions were there. Many people said, even if we ask for any monetary uh, redress, there's not enough money to pay for three years of our lives. Other groups said, I don't even want to talk about redress because that means we have to dredge up the memories of three or four years in camps and about the, uh, the question about being loyal or disloyal, about renunciation, about, uh, about volunteering for a, a, a suicide squad. And yet other people said, no, this is the only way that we can actually bring this to light and, and try to get some resolution. And so the divisions were there, but now since there is redress, since there is a presidential apology, 
Since there are reports like personal justice denied, which absolves the Japanese Americans, it's shikataganai. Those divisions that occurred a few years ago about what to do have all sort of been muted. But I think if you talk to some Japanese Americans and ask them how did they feel during that time when redress was talked about, many of them would still say, I still resisted it. And it's only a symbolic amount that came to us with respect to what had occurred during those years. Mm. How can you put a value? People uh, lost their mothers and daughters. Families were divided on, on, on the basis of issues for which the government created, such as, you know, are you going to be loyal to the United States or not? Mm. And th they were. Mm. But to ask that question means that, in mm. fact, there is already a taint that you are not loyal from the start. Mm. We have just a, a minute or so left. I wanted to, it is so interesting right now, there is so much attention on the Second World War, renewed attention in Eastern Europe, uh, soul searching among men who served in the Japanese army in this country, a new look again. Do you have any idea why it's all happening right now? It's really uh, a difficult um, question to give, to give you a response. I can only give you my own personal response because there's so many things going on. But uh, we know that for the, for the Japanese American incarceration, that for many years, it was difficult to obtain government documents to find out what had really gone on. And it's only recently that people can talk about what had gone on in, uh, in Europe, uh, in the United States, in, uh, about the uh, Second World War. We have some, some gap now and we can reflect upon it. And it allows people to think about what they want to leave as their legacy before they pass on. Mm. <laughs> and so if people would like to ensure that history is, is made more correct or that they get their own story out, then I think this is a, a, a good time for people to speak up. Uh, people who are in camps are passing away and they want to make sure that they want to say things. People who are in the military want to say what had gone on as they saw their, 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 their uh, fellow soldiers dying for our country and, and being given no, uh, no uh, recognition for it. So it's an urgency of the generation that lived through it, making sure the lesson is learned before they're gone. And I think underscored by the third, gener third, third generation saying, uh, tell us the story because you haven't told us it mm. up to this time. Tetsudan Kashima, I want to thank you very much for being a guest on Upon Reflection and a wonderful forward in personal justice tonight. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org classics.